On April the 19th of 2022, while New York police were responded to a domestic abuse report in Dutchess County, 34-year-old Jamie Feith was fatally shot by an officer. Feith and her partner were involved in a conflict at their Hyde Park home. Upon officers Joshua Kemlage, Brian Sweeney and State Trooper Christopher Miller's arrival, the conflict appeared to be de-escalated with officers escorting Feith out of the room. That's when events took a dark turn. When the officers tried to speak with Feith in the aftermath, she subsequently armed herself with a knife and attempted to stab them. Police body cam footage showed one of the officers repeatedly yelling, knife, into his walkie-talkie and requesting backup. While trying to get the weapon out of the woman's hand, Kem Lage wrestled Feith to the floor. Despite verbal commands from the officers, Feith stood up and continued to move through the home. In the footage, one of the officers could be heard saying, shoot her, before Kem Lage pulled the trigger twice, hitting Feith and knocking her to the floor. Feith's partner was yelling at them not to shoot her as Kem Lage fired a third and fourth shot. Feith suffered gunshot wounds to the chest and was pronounced dead at the scene. The case came under investigation by the state attorney, but in July of 2023, well over a year after the incident, it was announced that no charges would be sought against the officers. Number 18. Stacy Keith Carr A Harrison County jury found a Texas man guilty of a murder committed in the early morning hours of April the 1st of 2018. 22-year-old Beckfield man Richard Blaine Anderson was involved in a drunken fight during which he struck 25-year-old Stacy Keith Carr's ex-girlfriend. Upon his ex getting hit, Carr was called to the area and confronted Anderson, reportedly slapping him. Anderson subsequently pulled the gun out of his waders and shot Carr twice. Law enforcement responded shortly after 1.30 a.m. and found the victim in a wooded area near a Marshall ATV park. Carr succumbed to his gunshot wounds and was pronounced dead at around 3.30 a.m. When officers checked a truck parked nearby, they found Anderson sleeping inside. A .40 caliber pistol was recovered at the scene and the man was arrested on a murder charge. After being found guilty four years later, Anderson was sentenced to six years behind bars. Number 17. Richard Lee Richards Nine shots were fired at an Arizona man by 32-year-old Tucson police officer Ryan Remington on November the 29th of 2021. 61-year-old Richard Lee Richards, who was in a motorized wheelchair, stole a toolbox from a Walmart store located at 1650 West Valencia Road. As Richards was leaving the store carrying the item, an employee reportedly asked for the product's receipt. Richards subsequently pulled a knife on the employee who then contacted security shortly before 6 p.m. Remington, who was an off-duty police officer working as a security guard at the store, confronted Richards in the parking lot. The former ordered the latter to drop the knife and not to enter another store. When the orders were ignored, Remington shot the man several times, causing him to fall out of his wheelchair and die. Autopsy results later show that Richard had suffered seven gunshot wounds Two months later, Remington was fired for what the Tucson Police Department determined was excessive use of force. According to the department's police chief, the use of deadly force in the disturbing incident was a clear violation of their policy. Remington was indicted in August of 2022 on manslaughter charges. The following month, he pleaded not guilty and around that time, Richards' family filed a civil rights lawsuit against him and the city of Tucson. The manslaughter indictment was dropped four months later after the defense attorneys argued that the prosecutors presented a report that contained misleading statements. In January of 2023, a second grand jury also decided not to recommend charges of manslaughter. In light of a federal judge's ruling in March of the same year, the civil rights case would go forward. Additionally, the Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training Board began proceedings against Remington's certification under a unanimous vote. The man could potentially become ineligible to serve as an officer in the state. Number 16. Bridget Digerolamo a Louisiana woman was arrested on July the 6th of 2020 after brandishing a gun at a family she didn't want driving down her flooded street. 38-year-old Bridget Digerolamo 
had just finished repairing her Baton Rouge home from a flood that had occurred a year earlier when the streets had flooded again. Residents in the area located at the 6200 block of Chattanooga Drive were out on the street, telling drivers to drive carefully so as to prevent water from getting into their homes. When Demira Turner Lewis, together with her husband and daughter, was making her way home driving a cuck, Digeralamo came out of her residence wielding an aluminium baseball bat. She reportedly became irate and hit their vehicle with the baseball bat. As Turner Lewis went out of the vehicle to check for damages, Digeralamo went back to her home retrieving a handgun. The latter subsequently pointed her gun at them saying, you better move. After authorities were called, deputies arrested Digeralamo. She was later released on a $2,500 bond. The incident was caught on video and prompted the local school system, where Digeralamo was employed to conduct an internal investigation. After the video went viral, Digeralamo was fired. She was convicted on three counts of misdemeanor and aggravated assault with a firearm. As of the latest updates, her lawyers were challenging the guilty conviction by a jury, citing procedural mistakes. Number 15. Terrin Stately North Dakota authorities were called to the 1600 block of 33rd Avenue in Fargo. In the morning of May the 30th of 2020, dispatchers had received reports of a man who'd been stabbed. Responding officers found Keenan Poitra bleeding heavily in the apartment hallway due to a severed femoral artery. The 27-year-old later succumbed to his wounds in the groin area. When officers questioned his 32-year-old girlfriend, Terrin Stately, she claimed she didn't know what had happened to him. Officers then executed a search warrant and found a bloody knife placed in a garbage can in the apartment. Stately then changed her story, saying she'd been involved in a struggle with Poitra after confronting him about other women. She admitted to grabbing a steak knife and holding it up towards Poitra so he'd stay away from her. Accidentally slashing him, Stately was arrested on one count of murder with intent. The following year, she pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to serve seven years of incarceration as part of the agreement. Number 14. Douglas Lane after being caught looking under the women's bathroom stall at a Cracker Barrel restaurant, registered offender Douglas Lane was left with a bloodied face. The incident unfolded in Duncan, South Carolina on September the 20th of 2020. When a teen spotted the 53-year-old looking underneath the bathroom stall, Lane attempted to get away but several people confronted him. According to witnesses, people were hitting the man and when he got out to the parking lot, someone even tackled him. When law enforcement arrived, Lane was taken into custody on charges of voyeurism, simple possession of marijuana and paraphernalia. Number 13. David Castro 35-year-old Texas man Gerald W. Williams was sentenced to prison for mortally shooting a teen during a road rage incident in Houston. On July the 6th of 2021, Paul Castro and his two sons had just left an Astros game in their truck when a Buick merged into their lane. The Buick, which had been driven by Williams, had been aggressively swerving around vehicles before getting stuck in traffic. Paul reportedly made a hand gesture as he let Williams merge into his lane. For several miles, Williams followed the family and ultimately fired several shots at their truck, hitting one of the sons, David Castro, in the head. David was immediately taken to the hospital where he was put on life support but died two days later. Law enforcement initiated a manhunt for Williams who surrendered on August the 1st. He pleaded guilty to murder and was handed a 30-year sentence in January of 2023. Today's topic was requested by Zil Faratu. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 12. Jonathan Gilbert In Griffin, Georgia, Jonathan Gilbert was shot by three teens on July the 3rd of 2023 after confronting them about egging the house of a friend he was staying with. The 22-year-old had moved to Texas but was back in Georgia to take care of a ticket he couldn't settle online, according to his family. 19-year-old Mackenzie Davenport and Sidney Morhan and Jeremy Munson, both aged 18, arrived at the Dobbins Mill Road home and vandalized it with eggs. 
Gilbert consequently went out of the house to confront them, causing the teens to run back to their car. Morhan then grabbed a firearm and pulled the trigger, hitting Gilbert multiple times. The suspect subsequently drove away, leaving Gilbert dying in the middle of the road. Four days later, the Spalding County Sheriff's Office announced the arrest of Davenport, Morhan and Munson. All three were held with no bond on charges of malice murder, battery and criminal trespassing. Additionally, Morhan and Munson were charged with murder, aggravated assault and possession of a firearm. Number 11. Travis Filmley Jr. An Oregon man died on the evening of June the 30th of 2023 after being hit by a car at Portland's 33rd Drive and Elrod Road. As a white pickup truck was driving up and down Northeast 33rd Drive, its occupants were reportedly throwing fireworks onto the streets. 26-year-old Travis Filmley Jr., as well as others, came out of nearby RVs to confront the people in the pickup truck. At the same time, an unnamed individual got into a sedan and drove after the pickup truck, most likely also to confront them. As the pickup truck drew closer to Filmley, the driver successfully swerved to avoid him. However, the sedan following the truck hit and killed Filmley and its driver absconded. The latest reports indicated that authorities were still trying to find out the identities of the people in the pickup truck as well as who was driving the sedan. Number 10. Blake Mose. On April the 18th of 2023, Pleasanton police received reports about a California man bleeding inside a Home Depot located at 6000 Drive. The ordeal transpired shortly after 2.15 p.m when 26-year-old Blake Bowes, who worked as a loss prevention employee at the Home Depot, confronted a female shoplifter. A struggle subsequently ensued between the two, which ended with Mose being shot in the chest at close range. Responding officers tried to keep Mose alive before he was then taken to Eden Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. 15 minutes after the shooting, the suspect was located and detained by Alameda County Sheriff's deputies. She was identified as 32-year-old Benicia Knapps. Her getaway driver, 31-year-old David Guillory, was also apprehended. At the time of their arrests, Knapps' child was inside the vehicle. In the aftermath, the two were facing several charges, including murder, robbery, child endangerment, and conspiracy. As of the latest updates, both were booked into Santa Rita Jail. Number 9. Jeremiah McCray Jeremiah McCray from Newnan, Georgia was fatally shot after getting into a heated confrontation with the brother of his girlfriend. On April the 6th of 2023, the 18-year-old and the girlfriend's brother were in a home along Allenwood Road in Fayetteville when an argument between the two ensued, after which McCray armed himself with an AR-15 rifle and confronted the brother. The brother subsequently fired his own weapon at McRae. Authorities were called to the home shortly before 3 p.m. where they found McRae with multiple gunshot wounds. He was rushed to Piedmont Fayette Hospital where he succumbed to his wounds. According to investigators, it was unclear what had started the argument. The full investigation is still ongoing. Number 8. Shadina Smith on January the 16th of 2021, Shadina Smith had just left her New York City apartment in West 150th Street, near Frederick Douglass Boulevard, when she was accosted by a young man. He allegedly groped her, to which Smith reacted by returning home and telling her fiancé, 26-year-old Josh Hall. The couple rushed outside and confronted the aggressor, later identified as Musa Sise, age 19, in the lobby of the apartment building. Hall reportedly punched him in the face and Sise retaliated by brandishing a weapon and opening fire on the couple. 29-year-old Smith was struck three times in the chest while Hall was shot in the shoulder and abdomen. The couple were rushed to Harlem Hospital, where Hall was stabilized while Smith passed away. The deadly broad daylight shooting prompted an international manhunt for Cisse, whom the authorities initially suspected had fled to West Africa. Ten months after the incident, he was found behind the wheel of a stolen car on Riverside Drive in Sugar Hill. Cisse initially gave officers a fake name, but NYPD detectives soon realized he was the suspect for whom they'd been searching in connection to Smith's killing. 
Following his arrest, Cissé faced murder, attempted murder, and several weapons charges. Number 7. Marie Laguerre Surveillance footage of a confrontation on a street in Paris caused considerable outrage online in 2018 after a young woman was harassed and assaulted. Engineering student Marie Laguerre, aged 22, was passing by a cafe patio when her path intersected with that of a man who allegedly made lewd comments and wolf whistled her. Laguerre reportedly told him to shut up and they both continued walking in separate directions. Moments later, the man grabbed an ashtray from one of the cafe's tables and threw it over the patio at Laguerre, narrowly missing her. He then walked back to the young woman and without warning or provocation, forcefully struck her across the face. The attacker retreated and others from the patio intervened, including a man who'd armed himself with a chair to ensure he maintained his distance. The 25-year-old aggressor, only identified as Firas M under French court rules, was subsequently arrested and given six months in prison along with a further six-month suspended sentence. Firas wasn't charged with sexual harassment, as investigators found evidence of it to have been insufficient, but was ordered to undergo psychological treatment and attend a course on sexual violence awareness. He didn't have a fixed address at the time of the attack on Laguerre and had already served time in prison for violence against his mother and for pimping. As news of the assault began to circulate, Laguerre was praised for standing up to her harasser and she subsequently started a website where other victims could share their stories. The incident also added to the momentum of a pre-existing push for French legislation that would see catcallers and aggressively lecherous individuals facing potential on-the-spot fines of over $750. Number 6. Aisha Walker On November the 4th of 2017 in Winnipeg, Canada, a transgender woman was brutally attacked following a confrontation on a bus. 28-year-old Aisha Walker intervened after seeing that an intoxicated man was grinding up against a young female passenger, whom Walker had deduced was a stranger to her. A verbal confrontation ensued to which a third man, whom up to that point had been completely uninvolved in the exchange, reacted by telling Walker and the man she'd accused of harassment to shut up and sit down. The former maintained that she'd only been trying to protect a fellow passenger, but the third man suddenly punched her in the face. The attacker then got off the bus at the University of Winnipeg and fled the scene. Walker reported the assault to the bus driver, who subsequently cleared the vehicle and told her to file a police report. The forceful blow she'd sustained had left her with a black eye as well as damaged her. Seven of her teeth, which were chipped or broken, the police informed Walker that Manitoba Health would cover her emergency dental surgery. On December the 12th of 2017, the authorities announced that they'd arrested the man suspected of having attacked her and charged him with assault causing bodily harm. Number 5. Amanda Nunes At around 6.30 a.m. on August the 31st of 2020, Amanda Nunes was getting breakfast at a food stand in the city of Belford Rocho in the Brazilian state of Rio de Janeiro. 30-year-old Nunes overheard a couple making cruel comments about her weight and confronted them. A heated verbal argument ensued during the course of which, according to local authorities, Nunes slapped the man in the face. The latter then suddenly brandished a pistol and shot Nunes in the head. She was rushed to the hospital and subsequently transferred to an ICU, where she succumbed to her gunshot injury a few hours later. In the incident's immediate aftermath, activists were filmed walking through the streets while wearing t-shirts with Nunez's face and demanding justice for her. As of the latest updates on the shooting, which Nunez's social media followers labeled a cowardly act, local police were still reviewing CCTV footage and talking to witnesses in an effort to identify her killer. Number 4. Andrew Turner On August the 28th of 2021, Kelsey O'Hara and her friends were out drinking in Bridlington, England. A confrontation ensued between 19-year-old O'Hara and Andrew Turner, aged 58. The former asked that the man apologize for a previous incident in which he'd allegedly bumped into one of her friends. Turner refused, to which O'Hara reacted by throwing her purse onto the ground and attacking him. O'Hara, whom multiple local media outlets would later describe as a baby-faced teenager, punched Turner in the head. She delivered the strike with such force that the man was knocked unconscious. He collapsed and hit the pavement with the back of his head, 
sustaining a cut of five to seven inches. Turner tried getting to his feet upon regaining consciousness, but was initially unable to do so. Police and paramedics arrived at the scene, but he refused to be taken to a hospital, as his injuries were not believed to have been that severe. Within days on September the 3rd, Turner passed away and the authorities launched a murder investigation. They didn't disclose the cause of the man's death, but citing evidence from a pathologist and a neuropathologist determined that O'Hara's punch hadn't been a factor in his passing. The teenager, who admitted wounding, was spared jail time in early April of 2022 and instead sentenced to a six-month curfew. Number 3. Juliet Powell Brown 47-year-old Juliet Powell Brown was parked in a sedan along with her husband and another woman at a discount tire store in Aurora, Colorado. On August the 7th of 2018, at around 5.30 p.m., Henry Wardwell backed his GMC pickup truck, which had a camping trailer in tow, into the sedan. 48-year-old Wardwell told the trio that he would be getting his insurance and registration so that they could deal with the small fender bender. It would later emerge that the man didn't have insurance and was also driving without a valid license. Once he was back in his pickup truck, Wardwell drove off, prompting Powell Brown and her family to follow him until he eventually stopped farther down the street. The woman and her husband jumped out of their vehicle to confront him, approaching the pickup truck on the driver's side. Wardwell then turned his steering wheel, accelerated and tried to get away by making a U-turn. In doing so, he struck Powell Brown, causing her to fall and become trapped under the wheels of the trailer. Wardwell then continued driving, dragging the woman behind his vehicle until she was freed in the area of South Chambers Road, where her mangled body was subsequently found. Powell Brown, who local media outlets reported was a newlywed, was later pronounced dead. Wardwell was ultimately sentenced to 18 years in prison after being convicted on five counts, including leaving the scene of an accident involving death, a Class three felony, and vehicular manslaughter. Number 2. Orm A lover's spat involving three people from Pechabun, Thailand, devolved into an attack involving a sword in April of 2022. As reported by local media, 40-year-old Orm had been having relations with a couple only identified as Air and his wife Note, aged 35 and 38 respectively. The latter two stopped meeting up with Orm roughly a year prior after she'd asked if her Bangkok-based boyfriend could join them. In the meantime, Orm broke off her relationship with the man and began pestering the couple to resume their prior arrangement, which Aaron Note repeatedly refused. After yet another rejection in early April, Orm went to their home armed with a sword. The couple filmed the ensuing confrontation as they took shelter behind their front door. After pulling the blade from its hilt, Orm rammed it through a crack between the front door and the doorframe. The razor-sharp sword was only inches from Ear's face, with the tip pointed towards Note, but fortunately no one was hurt. The woman eventually left the scene following repeated pleas from Ear. The couple later spoke to the media and claimed to have had some really great times with Orm in the past. After they'd stopped seeing her, however, they noted that she kept pressuring them for intercourse and harassing them, which they attributed to her developing feelings for one or both of them. Note and Ear didn't report it to the police because they wanted to keep their lifestyle private. They hoped that by sharing the footage of the sword attack, Orm's newfound notoriety would deter her from further harassment. Immediately after number one, we have our video on when parades go wrong lined up for you next. Keep watching if you had missed that one until now. Number one, Jamie Rathburn. In 2019, a South Carolina woman was arrested after sneaking into an elementary school and confronting children who'd reportedly been bullying her son. The Greenville County Sheriff's Office was alerted to the incident by other parents who'd seen a video that Jamie Rathburn had uploaded to her Facebook. In the clip, the woman ranted about she'd made her way to her son's classroom and, unsure who'd actually been responsible for the alleged bullying, threatened a group of children that they better stop messing with her kid. Surveillance footage confirmed that on May the 17th, she'd entered the Greenbrier Elementary School without performing the mandatory signing at the office. There was no audio in the video, but statements from witnesses maintained that Rathburn then began berating the children, aged eight to nine, as they were lined up in the hall and waiting for class to begin. Rathburn was arrested a few days later and charged with non-student interfering, disrupting or disturbing schools. The woman was banned from the learning institution's property. While she later apologized and claimed that her emotions had gotten the better of her, 
Rathburn criticised what she'd deemed a poor handling of the bullying incident by the school. Number 8. The 2015 Oklahoma State Homecoming Parade On the morning of October the 24th of 2015, Oklahoma State University held its annual homecoming parade on the streets of downtown Stillwater. The yearly celebration is also known as the Sea of Orange Parade, in reference to OSU's school colors, and it's widely regarded as one of the best university homecoming parades in the country. In 2015, as the festive procession made its way down the city's main street, 25-year-old Adacha Chambers was forced to wait at a streetlight that had been yielding to the stream of parade floats and participating vehicles. Local authorities would later report that the young woman then ran the red light before circumventing a traffic barricade and crashing into a marked police motorcycle, which was sent hurtling into a nearby crowd of pedestrians. Chambers subsequently accelerated directly into the crowd and struck several people with her vehicle. Emergency responders were called to the scene in order to tend to over 50 distressed parade goers, many of whom were rushed to local hospitals for more intensive treatment. It was reported that the collision had resulted in a total of four deaths. Chambers was charged with four counts of second-degree murder upon being taken into custody, although investigators initially believed that she'd been driving under the influence when the crash occurred. It was determined that the young woman's blood alcohol level had actually been below the legal driving limit. Chambers ultimately agreed to a plea deal that allowed her to avoid the death penalty. She was instead sentenced to four concurrent life terms, with an additional 10 years for each of her 39 felony assault convictions, which were also ordered to run concurrently. Number 7. The 2020 Mardi Gras Parade in 2020, a pair of tragic accidents occurred on the streets of New Orleans, Louisiana, during the annual Mardi Gras celebrations. Just before 9 p.m. on February the 19th, a tandem parade float belonging to the all-female social club known as Mystic Crew of Knicks proceeded along the city's famous magazine street. As they passed, 58-year-old Geraldine Carmouche attempted to cross the street by climbing in between the two sections of the float. Carmouche then tripped on the hitch connecting them and fell to the ground. Before she was able to get back up, the woman was crushed beneath the second half of the float as it continued moving along the road. The Orleans Parish Coroner's Office later confirmed the identity of the woman who'd reportedly been related to two members of the Mystic crew. Three days later, a man whose name wasn't immediately released by the authorities was struck and killed by a tandem parade float in a similar manner as Carmouche had been. According to the Associated Press, the float involved in the second incident was the same one that killed a parade goer in 2008, which had been the last such death involving a tandem float prior to 2020. In response to the two deaths, city officials implemented last-minute rule changes that took effect for the remainder of the year's Mardi Gras festivities. The Washington Post reported that each half of the tandem float was required to be pulled by its own tractor. Number 6. The 2021 Winter Garden Christmas Parade On December 12, 2021, organizers of the annual Winter Garden Golf Cart Christmas Parade in Florida were forced to reschedule the event after one of the police officers aiding in his preparation was nearly hit by a car. Officials in Winter Garden reported that members of the local police department had been dispatched to the city's downtown area, where they were closing down the roads to clear the way for the upcoming parade. As the authorities were doing so, a vehicle driven by 27-year-old Terrius Jorrell Baker reportedly began accelerating towards them at a high rate of speed. A policeman in Baker's path narrowly avoided being struck by the oncoming car, which subsequently crashed into another vehicle that had been traveling in the same direction. Following the collision, Baker fled the scene on foot. An off-duty member of the Kissimmee Police Department had reported as having been present in the crowd gathering for the parade. The unnamed law enforcement officer gave chase and was able to hold the suspect down until the arrival of reinforcements. Baker was taken into custody along with a female passenger named Elizabeth Chavez. Two juveniles had also been inside the vehicle at the time of the incident, both of whom were reportedly turned over to the Department of Children and Families following the two adults' arrests. Number 5. The Midland Train Crash On November the 15th of 2012, a charity organization called Show of Support 
sponsored a parade in Midland, Texas, in honor of U.S. military veterans. The event's organizers had planned for a flatbed trailer, which was being used as a parade float, to pass through the city before arriving at a veteran's benefit. The float was carrying 26 passengers, 12 of whom were veterans who'd been wounded in action. As the parade was traveling on its route, a Union Pacific Railroad freight train traveling from Los Angeles, California to Shreveport, Louisiana, passed through the city of Midland. At 4.36 p.m., the parade float reportedly entered the railroad crossing, in spite of the fact that the warning signal had already been activated. According to an investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board, the oncoming locomotive sounded its horn as it approached the intersection, and the engineer also activated the train's emergency brakes in a final effort to avoid the imminent collision with the float. The preventative measures ultimately proved futile, as the train, which had reportedly been moving at a speed of 62 miles per hour, violently crashed into the flatbed. The impact killed two passengers instantly, while two more passed away after being transported to Midland Memorial Hospital. A total of 16 others suffered non-fatal injuries during the crash. The four deceased victims were identified as Lawrence Bovin, William Lubbers, Gary Stufer, and Joshua Michael, each of whom had previously received the Purple Heart Decoration during their military careers. In November of 2013, the Safety Board issued a report on its investigation. They concluded that the probable cause of the accident had been the failure of the City of Midland and show of support to properly notify the railroad of its planned route in advance of the parade. Number 4. The 2021 Puerto Rican Day Parade a 24-year-old man was gunned down following the Puerto Rican Day Parade in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago on June the 19th of 2021. Cook County authorities identified the alleged gunman as Anthony Lorenzi, aged 34. An investigation revealed that a minor traffic accident had triggered a brawl during post-parade celebrations on Division Street near Spalding Avenue. As was captured on video by a bystander's cell phone, the victim, Giovanni Arzuega and his girlfriend, 25-year-old Yasmin Perez, had been forcefully removed from their vehicle after the crash and were beaten by a group of unidentified assailants. Lorenzi, a convicted felon and member of the Latin Kings gang, reportedly involved himself in the altercation despite not having been part of the initial traffic dispute. In the moments that followed, Lorenzi pulled out a firearm and fatally shot Arzuega in the back of the neck in a manner described as being typical of an execution. Perez also suffered a fatal gunshot wound, although investigators believed that she'd most likely been accidentally shot by her boyfriend during the melee. Lorenzi fled to San Diego, California in the aftermath of the shooting, but he was eventually tracked down and arrested on July the 9th. He was ultimately charged with one count of first-degree murder. Number 3. The 2015 Carnival Parade on February the 17th of 2015, thousands of people assembled in the streets of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to take part in the annual carnival celebration. The three-day parade through the island nation's capital regularly coincides with other Mardi Gras festivals around the world. As a parade float belonging to a music group called Barricade Crew passed through the raucous crowds, it reportedly approached a low-hanging power line. In order to facilitate its passing underneath the precariously positioned cable, Someone allegedly used a pole to move the electrical line out of the packed float's path. The unidentified individual was instantly electrocuted, as were several other people on the float. An electrical fire consequently erupted, prompting hundreds of bystanders to flee the area. The victims were taken to a nearby hospital for treatment following the arrival of emergency responders. The Department of Civil Protection reported in the immediate aftermath of the accident that at least 20 people had been killed and another 46 had been injured. Number 2. The 1997 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade Macy's, a department store in the US, annually presents one of the world's largest parades on Thanksgiving Day in New York City. The three-hour event has traditionally been held in the city's Manhattan borough since its inception in 1924. Among the most notable incidents to have occurred throughout its history was a 1997 accident involving the Cat in the Hat themed balloon. Due to particularly strong gusts of wind, the balloon had been pushed off its course and subsequently struck a street sidelight post. The falling debris, which was estimated to have weighed roughly 100 pounds, ultimately struck 
four parade goers on the street below. One of the victims, identified as 33-year-old Kathleen Carona, consequently suffered a fractured skull that left her in a coma which reportedly lasted 24 days. The woman later sued Macy's, the city of New York, and a city contractor in connection to the incident. The New York Times reported that Corona had sought $95 million in compensatory damages from the city and the lamppost manufacturer, in addition to $300 million in punitive damages from Macy's. A settlement agreement was ultimately reached and Corona was awarded an undisclosed amount of money for the severe injuries she'd sustained. The following year, the parade eliminated larger balloons like the cat in the hat after implementing new regulations. Number 1. The 2021 Waukesha Christmas Parade The city of Waukesha, Wisconsin hosts an annual Christmas parade to celebrate the holiday season. Although the Milwaukee suburb had canceled the event in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, city officials decided to bring back the celebration the following year. At approximately 4.40 p.m. on November 21, 2021, an SUV driven by 39-year-old Darrell Edward Brooks Jr. smashed through a police barricade and rammed into a crowd of people that had been observing the parade. A police officer at the scene reportedly pounded on the hood of Brooks's vehicle in an effort to get him to stop, while another officer fired his gun towards the same end. The driver fled the scene, but his car, which had been damaged in the brutal collision with the parade goers, was tracked down by local investigators later that night. After Brooks was taken into custody, it emerged that he'd been arrested only three weeks prior in connection to an incident in which he'd struck his girlfriend with a car. It was revealed to have been the same vehicle used in the attack on the parade. On November the 23rd, the authorities reported that the harrowing vehicular assault had resulted in six deaths and 62 injuries. Brooks was thereupon charged with six counts of intentional homicide, though investigators believed that the suspect hadn't known anyone who'd been attending the parade. In December, Brooks faced additional felony charges of intimidating a witness and intimidation of a victim. He allegedly called his girlfriend 49 times from jail, threatening her not to cooperate with Waukesha Police's investigation. Brooks was scheduled to appear in court on February 2nd of 2022. Thanks for watching. Who would you rather confront, an ex-boxer or a Karen? Let us know in the comments section below.